Thank you all so much for being here. It's such a joy for me as a first time author to be in such fantastic company. And I'm thrilled about the conversation we're going to have and that there are people here who want to hear history conversation. That's such a joy for all of us. So I thought I would start with sort of the perfect first question, which is that, you know, you guys have both written several books. You have these long, fantastic careers. What drew you to your particular story? What was the origin story of these two books? Sure, go for it. So I have been a teacher of history since the late 1970s. That's a long time. And I still consider myself primarily a teacher. I got into the academic side of it so I could get a job teaching in college. And I, I did the academic angle to it. Um, as long as was necessary, but I always knew that I wanted to write for general audiences. I also teach to a general audience. I teach a required course in U.S. history, an introductory course, a two-semester course, to the room that I have seats 480. So I have 480 students, and these are almost all non-history majors. I ask them on the first day of the semester, how many of you are here because you have to be? And 95% of them raise their hand. <laughs> Which is why I'm so thrilled to be addressing you, because none of you have to be here. You came because you wanted to. But I aim for people who are just sort of generally interested in history. But because I've been teaching for a long time, I've been teaching about the American Revolution, the subject of my book. But I hadn't written a book about the American Revolution. I I sort of mentioned it in passing, well, a little more than passing, in a book I did on Benjamin Franklin. But I wanted to get at the question that, to me, lies at the heart of this revolution or any revolution, and that is, how do you decide that you are going to take up arms against your country and wage war against it? What causes people to do this? And I know, because I have to cover the American Revolution in one lecture, that you can't get into that very deeply at, at that level. But it's the crucial question. It's the question of, so why do we decide the kinds of things we decide? And there's always a combination of politics, you know, no taxation without representation, but it's also very personal because you can look at two individuals who grew up together, who had lives that tracked each other, and then they went different ways. Why was that? You, this particular revolution, like other revolutions, and, and so the title of the book is Our First Civil War. Because I look at that part of it, the part that tends to get overlooked in the first glance at the American Revolution, which is seen as Americans against the British. And all the Americans want independence, and all the British don't. But in fact, it was much more complicated than that. John Adams himself acknowledged that at the beginning of this period of troubles, there were probably only a third of Americans who were in favor of independence. And then there were a third who were adamantly opposed to independence. And then there was that group in the middle, which the other two groups fought over for most of the revolution. So I really wanted to get at the question, I mean, I, I put it to several of the individuals that I look at. So why did George Washington become a rebel? I, it seems to me that George Washington was a very unlikely rebel because people who try to overturn the status quo are usually people who've not, not done well by the status quo. And almost nobody did better by the status quo in colonial Virginia than George Washington. Washington. Same question for Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was this world celebrity, and the British Empire had been very good to Benjamin Franklin. So why at the age of 70 did he say, no more, and I'm out of here, and I'm going to try to create a new country? And then why did William Franklin, his son, take the opposite view? Why did Thomas Hutchinson, who knew both of the Franklins and became lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, why did he stick with Britain. So this is the basic question I pose, and I hope to convey at least my impression of the answers in the book. Peter, your turn. I, uh, I first came upon John Marshall Harlan uh, when I was a law student at Columbia in the late 1980s. And uh, his dissents in both the economic cases that sort of took away economic freedom during that time and racial cases that imposed segregation kind of leapt off the page to a law student. You know, 
learning law can be a fairly dry endeavor. Uh, the attention is always on the majority opinion. You know, you're teaching how law develops over time, uh, one case at a time. When it finally becomes the law, it reaches a majority of the Supreme Court, that's the moment that people pay attention to. And yet, when I was a student in the uh, 1980s, late 1980s, it was a hundred years after John Marshall Harlan's great dissents. And the question in my mind was, how did this one person who in his time was such an extraordinary outlier, you know, called an eccentric exception by history, the lone dissenter in case after case after case, and yet fit very comfortably into late 20th century jurisprudence. It's like he was speaking out of history to a current day audience in these, in these cases. So I was intrigued by Harlan and wondered about how Harlan became so different, you know, from the time that I was in my 20s. Fast forward another, you know, 20 years, and I'm the uh, Washington bureau chief for the Boston Globe in 2005, and we're covering the uh, nominations of John Roberts and Samuel Alito, which, if you remember, happened right around the same time. And uh, I was reading in a legal encyclopedia some backgrounds on justices and saw a one sentence reference to the fact that John Marshall Harlan was reputed to be the half brother of Robert Harlan, the leading African American politician in Ohio. And at that point, I began to think, well, you know, this, this story may be a clue as to why John Marshall Harlan uh, looked at the law so differently than his colleagues. As it turned out, you know, Robert Harlan is not the answer to everything about John Marshall Harlan's jurisprudence, and it never is. There's never one experience that influences people. But I felt like this was sort of an exploration for the roots of wisdom in the law, because we're now at a stage where we can go back to the era when John Marshall Harlan was on the Supreme Court, which was from 1877 until 1911. And we know now, you know, the results of those decisions, right? We know who was right in a broad sense and who was wrong in a broad sense. And there's very little dispute about the histories during his, during his time. You know, I, I went into this project thinking there'd be some defenders of those majority opinions that he was dissenting against, but there, there aren't. Uh, today's conservatives have largely uh, abandoned the conservatives of that era. Everyone agrees with Harlan, essentially. And we look at that time and we say, what are the two things that stand out most in that time? One, it was the start of segregation, which has bedeviled this country for more than a century. And, and we are still living with the effects of segregation today. The other was income inequality and the fact that um, so many uh, uh, people lived in such, such dire poverty while others were building you know, mansions that were like replicating Louis XIV. And you wonder, how did the country get to that state? And the answer is, it, it wasn't politics. I mean, there was the political will to deal with these things at various points. Congress actually passed a Civil Rights Act, right? Uh, in 1875, a very sweeping one. Uh, and then in the early 1890s, Congress, Congress passed the Sherman Antitrust Act to try to break up monopolies. Uh, Congress passed an income tax. Uh, and state legislatures slipped in to do things like minimum wages and started uh, enforcing labor conditions. The Supreme Court ruled against all of those things. You know, you had in, in the case of the civil rights cases of 1883, the Civil Rights Act was declared unconstitutional. You had in a case called Giles v. Harris, the Supreme Court refused to enforce voting rights, even though it's right there in the post-Civil War amendments. Plessy v. Ferguson endorsing the legal architecture of segregation. You also had in the Pollock case, the Supreme Court declared the income tax unconstitutional. You had the Sherman Antitrust Act was declared unconstitutional, a case, the Knight case. Lochner case said all labor regulations by states per se were unconstitutional. The common thread in all of those cases is John Marshall Harlan dissented in all of them. They are all now in the rogues gallery of Supreme Court decisions. So the starting point for my book is what are the roots of wisdom in the law? And how does personal experience influence jurisprudence? And what lessons can we draw uh, from Harlan's life uh, that might be applicable to today's jurisprudence. Excellent. So, unfortunately, as an early American historian, I've read a lot of the books. And this is a very crowded ocean to be wading into. You said it was your first book about this period in general. What 
about it did you feel was new that you really needed to tell? Well, in the first place, I'm less taken by the necessity of saying something that no one has ever said before than some other authors. In part because I think it reflects a disparity between academics and general readers. So I teach at the University of Texas at Austin, and we have a very large library. And if everything, we have basically anything that has ever been published on the American Revolution. But not everybody gets to use that library. And in fact, most people don't. And so my first gauge, and I'm answering this question in part as a very practical matter. If you walk into Joseph Beth bookstore or any other bookstore, if you can't find that book on the bookshelf, it might as well not exist. Now this is a little bit less true now with online booksellers and used books and all this, but still, if something hasn't been written about for 15 or 20 years, it's essentially fallen off the radar screen of modern interest in a subject. But a second part of the answer is that questions that have been posed about the past change. The past itself largely doesn't change. Yes, occasionally you will find new information about the past. But on a field, as you suggest, Lindsay, that has been as thoroughly mined as the American Revolution, I'm not going to turn up a new trove of letters from George Washington to somebody. It just doesn't happen this way. But the things that we look at in the past, it's a little bit like you know, looking at the stuff you've seen before, and all of a sudden the light's a little bit different than it was. And so something stands out that didn't stand out before. And this is actually a bit of an ex post facto answer to your question, but I've just been reading to review a book on how civil wars start. It's a really good book, and when it comes by an author named Barbara Walter, and she teaches at UC San Diego. So if you happen, if you're interested in the subject, buy the book when it comes out. But what she's really talking about is she doesn't distinguish between civil wars, revolutions, insurgencies, and so on. So how do people make up their minds to take up arms against their government? And turns out, as Barbara Walter confirms with data, that this is much more common than it was 60 or 70 years ago. That civil wars are more com way more common than they were 100 years ago. And so I want to look at, I mean, I guess we were sort of thinking similar because I hadn't seen the book when I started my project. But we live in a time when lots of people are taking up arms against their government. So why do they make these decisions? So the only book that I was fully aware of that, that sort of took on this question was written by Charles and a guy named Charles Andrew about uh, 60 years ago. I think it's called The Good Americans or something like this, but it was on, on the loyalists. So, but I would say in general, and this is, this is not a book about loyalists per se, but it is about this decision process. The last thing I will say on this is that it's been my experience as a reader, but also as an observer of what other people read, a good story is worth retelling. And I think this is, of course, the founding story of the United States of America. So even if I didn't have anything new to say, if it's a good story and I tell it well, it will find an audience. But there is new stuff in here. <laughs> Well, you're also being humble because I think it's true that each historian is almost like a snowflake and looks at things differently and is going to ask questions differently. So a brain is going to literally process the same data and evidence in a different way. Sort of inverse question, Harlan is not really somebody that's been written about all that much, but is this phenomenal story? How come? Why don't we know who he is more? Why do only law students really read about him until now when you should all go buy the fantastic book? <laughs> um, I think that there's a, there's a prejudice in our society against dissenters. Um, those of us who are of a certain age can remember the people who are against the Iraq war. Uh, they're still ridiculed, right? You know, nobody comes back and says, 
Jacques Chirac was a great visionary. He was against the Iraq war. Nobody says, our and Dottie Roy, really, she, she knows everything. You know, she knows it. You know, there's a, there's a sense that our society matures together and reaches certain points together. And as I was mentioning before, when it comes to the law, the moment to celebrate is when the majority of the Supreme Court says something is the law, even if there were other people all along saying it should have been that way. We just don't tend to pay attention to them. I also think that uh, stories like Harlan's get caught somewhere between history and law. You know, the legal profession really does not teach dissenters and doesn't pay any attention to them. I know we have some law professors in the room, but, uh, you know, Harlan's dissents are not a big focus of anyone's curriculum in law. And historians also tend to defer things that happen on the Supreme Court more to the realm of, of law than history. So it's like he kind of fell between the cracks uh, in some in some ways. Um, I think that, you know, part of what made him a man out of his time, out of step with his time, is something that's very relevant to this audience today, which is his Kentucky roots. Uh, when he was on the Supreme Court, all of the other justices at most points, it changed a little bit in the very last years he was on the court, but almost all of them were Wall Street um, attorneys. You know, he was born in 1833 and his contemporaries up north were born and came of age at a time when being a lawyer meant, you know, hanging a shingle on your, on your small town door and doing wills and helping people sort out problems. With the advent of the railroad economy um, coming in the middle of the 19th century uh, in the great trusts that resulted from the railroad economy, uh, the profession of law was transformed. And suddenly there were these superstar lawyers who were mainly arguing before state legislatures and then later before the federal uh, government to preserve the economic rights of these trusts and the railroads rights of access. There was a tremendous amount of legal attention given to this economic transformation. So suddenly you had this class of lawyers that became as wealthy as the people who owned the companies that hired them. And we had, after Abraham Lincoln, uh, pretty much an unbroken string of business conservatives in the White House, all Republicans, and then Grover Cleveland, who was thought to be a bourbon Democrat, a Wall Street Democrat. So they all appointed these national caliber attorneys to the Supreme Court. Harlan got on essentially because it was part of the 1876 disputed presidential election where Hayes was trying to appease people, Democrats and Southerners, promised to put a Southerner on the court. And Harlan was basically the only quasi Southerner who was acceptable to Northern liberals. And he had a hard time getting on the court, but he came out in through this back door onto the court. So during most of the time that he served, the dominant force on the court was uh, free, you know, laissez-faire economic conservatives from the North. He saw everything, race and economic issues, through a different set of eyes because of his experiences here in Kentucky. Very different economy, very different view of Wall Street, very different view of race. You know, he was held in suspicion because he wasn't from an abolitionist family, while many of the Northern justices were. Uh, but on the other hand, the Northern justices never had any experience in dealing with black people, and, and Harlan had many black friends and was constantly interacting with the black community. So it, all the roots of his difference and partly why he was neglected uh, by history uh, come from Kentucky. Fantastic. <laughs> so how does our view of the American Revolution and this story change if we put it through that lens of a civil war? Why is that such a central part of the narrative and how does that sort of still challenge our contemporary moment and our relationship with the founding, which we really, really hold on to? In the first place, I would say it should mitigate to some degree the triumphalism that often surrounds our study of the American Revolution. Because at first glance, the good guys won, the bad guys lost, hooray. But it depends on, of course, how you categorize good guys and bad guys. Well, the Americans won and the British lost. Well, no, not the, the Americans did not all win. And there were somewhere between 60 and 100,000 Americans who fled for their lives at the end of the war. Now, the book was well finished and was on its way to the bookstores almost when the war in Afghanistan ended. And I was sort of reflecting on the fact that wars in general 
do not end well. They almost always end messily, in part because wars are almost never this group of discrete people here against that group of discrete people there. It's always maybe there's a majority over here, but then there's some other folks who came along and likewise on the other side. And so in observing the difficulties of Afghans who had supported the United States for the last 20 years, what are they going to do? And this was a very pressing topic just at the end of last summer. Well, exactly this same question faced the American loyalists. What are we going to do? Because Britain was to the 1770s and 1780s and the American Revolution, what the United States was to the war in Afghanistan in the first part of this century. And so it's kind of a reminder that, as I say, wars do not end cleanly. There's always a lot of other stuff to deal with. And also, it's, it's very tempting for Americans to look at the American Revolution as a good revolution in contrast to something like the French Revolution that really went off the rails and all this blood was shed. Well, it's true that there wasn't anything like the bloodshed of the French terror, but that's in part because the ones on the wrong side had an exit strategy. They could leave. And most of the people on the wrong side of the French Revolution had nowhere to go. And so it was, I'll, I'll just say that temperamentally, I'm somebody who is a contrarian by nature. And if everybody is saying one thing, if everybody is thinking one thing, then I just am naturally disposed to dissent, which is why I always like John Marshall Harlan. <laughs> <laughs> And so there's, there's that part of it. And so I'm, I wanted to just remind folks that history generally is more complicated than you think. And this is almost independent of how complicated you think history is. It's more complicated than that. And I, I make this point to my students and to audiences like you because it's really tempting to look back in the past for simple answers as to what we're supposed to do today. So what lesson does history teach us? Well, my standard answer that has developed over time is, if anything, it should teach us humility because this world is complicated. It's very tempting for each generation to look smugly on the past and say, boy, how did they get things so wrong? And why did they not recognize the wisdom and foresight of John Marshall Harlan? And the answer is, well, because they were stuck in that time. So I kind of like to complicate things and like to stir things up a little bit. <laughs> I think that tendency to dissent might be something that goes hand in hand with our profession. I think it does, yeah, because, you know, I mean, because otherwise, you know, we'd all agree that this is what this period in history meant. Case closed. We'll move on. It'd be we very don't. boring. Yeah. So before we picked up our microphones, we were talking about how Harlan's story, his life story, has a lot to offer to our current moment. And I didn't really let you answer that because I wanted to save that good content for once we were in front of an audience. So can you share with us I mean, you, you sort of already hinted at it, that Harlan feels like a really modern figure, but what about him speaks to our current moment? What does his life tell us? And, you know, why is this a 21st century story? Um, I think there are many answers to that question. And one of them that we did discuss earlier is that you know, he attests to the power of transformation. He was very influenced by his life experiences. Life experiences included the tremendous fear that he felt here in Kentucky uh, growing up and then coming of age as a young politician uh, in the shadow of the looming Civil War. He really believed, his father believed, other followers of Henry Clay, which the Harlans were, uh, believed that Civil War was going to destroy Kentucky, that because of geography, uh, it was going to be the battleground, and because of politics, where it was split between slave and free sympathies, it was going to be, its civic life would be destroyed. So his entire upbringing in life was spent 
trying to find ways to avoid the Civil War. Henry Clay was one of the great statesmen in American history. He was also known as the great compromiser, and the Harlans were 100% behind those compromises. John Marshall Harlan's father, who was a big influence on him, was, was part of the colonization society that Clay had put together. Uh, they talked at various points about compensating slave owners. They were constantly trying to find ways to geographically limit slavery that would be provide enough protection to the South. I think that he learned over time the limits of compromise. And after this, I don't think he would ever have repudiated his actions from before the Civil War, but I think that after the Civil War, he felt that inequality was a great wrong, and he was not able to sort of say that before the Civil War because politically he was trying to sort of smooth things over and keep things going. After the Civil War, you can take the lessons of what happened, and he fought the Civil War, he saw death, he stepped over bodies, he also fought desperately on street corners here in Lexington, but also in Louisville, uh, with a bullhorn to try to prevent the state from going to the Confederacy and to stay neutral at various points. These were enormous formative experiences. He also had the relationship with Robert Harlan, who grew up in his house, half, half white, half black, and um, was enslaved, uh, but, but treated more like a family member, and went on to become incredibly wealthy and powerful, more wealthy and powerful than any of his other siblings or any, anyone else in the family. Um, so all of these things add up to him. So when, when he's on the Supreme Court, and uh, the Northern justices are accepting, you know, things like the separate but equal doctrine and writing opinions that had a, a white supremacy cast to them and that seemed to accept as fact the idea that people who had been enslaved were, were kept in an infantile slate, uh, state. That was in uh, one of those opinions uh, that, uh, uh, that there were tremendous differences in sort of aptitude and ability between the races. Um, Harlan not only understood that not to be true because of his experience with Robert Harlan and other African Americans, he was friends with Frederick Douglass and other people like that, regularly interacting with African Americans. He also uh, came to, to uh, believe that the Supreme Court in getting the Dred Scott decision wrong, that was the end of all of his hopes for compromise. So he had this, this almost like a traumatic, post-traumatic reaction to the Dred Scott decision that he recognized that when the Supreme Court got something wrong, there was no recourse within the country, in this case, except for war. So it gave him the courage of his convictions. It led him to believe that the inequality that existed under slavery was a, a direct offense to the founding principles of the country. Same kind of evolution that Abraham Lincoln went through. Um, and, and yet here he was on the Supreme Court trying vigilantly to prevent another civil war from happening. And that's what he saw in these race decisions as segregation started to take hold. He had a horror that essentially it was, it was re-establishing the preconditions that led to the civil war. He had the same feelings in an area that's gotten much less attention, which is the insular cases, which was when the United States took over uh, governance of the Philippines and Hawaii and Cuba and Puerto Rico. And there were a series of cases before the Supreme Court that largely turned on the question of do people in these protectorates have constitutional rights or not? Uh, in the justices had a really hard time with this decision, but ultimately the cases came out saying they don't. Uh, Harlan was the leader of the faction that said the Constitution follows the flag. There is no higher authority in this country than the Constitution. You know, Congress may want to set whatever rules it wants for the Philippines, but if you are a person living under the power of the Constitution, the Constitution comes, comes first. In his dissents, when you read them, you'll see that there are tremendous echoes of the, the experience of the Civil War and the fear of inequality. He says very openly, you know, we cannot have a country in which one group of people have individual rights under the Constitution, another group has, is living under a system that's cobbled together by Congress and the courts with no uh, rights whatsoever. So he envisioned future civil wars, essentially, and civil disputes that, that really did come to pass in terms of terrible disagreements. You know, most recently in the Guantanamo situation and all the questions of people being held in U.S. territory overseas, um, but obviously the legacy of segregation too uh, uh, today. So
I think that he attests to the power of transformation. And today's justices tend to come from one camp or the other, and they tend to be sort of designated from very early ages and earmarked for the Supreme Court and appointed at a very young age. Um, but they don't have anything like the life experiences or the character experience, the character building experiences that Harlan had. And um, I, I think that, you know, everybody can change, everybody can grow. Uh, we're not in an era where people can fight in a civil war and have those kinds of experiences. But, um, you know, one lesson for, for future Supreme Court justices and people appointing them is, you know, appoint, appoint people of character and maturity who are capable of independent judgment. So I'm sure you guys have gotten this question an awful lot as well as you've been talking about your books. But one of the things that people often ask me is, you know, oh, our country is so terribly divided. This is such a partisan moment. Have we ever had a moment like this before? And I usually say, well, I think the 1790s were pretty bad. The 1850s were pretty bad. The 1890s were pretty bad. But if your closest parallel is either a civil war to start the country or an actual civil war, that's not so great. Not, not a great parallel to be building off of. So do you see parallels in this moment? Do we have some off ramps that are, these two books can offer us of how to avoid that sort of conflict and try and pull back together? Or do you wanna continue the doom and gloom that I've um, offered? <laughs> I'll try to answer that. And I'll say, I'll use an answer that I gave when I actually, I think the last time I was here, at the Kentucky Book Festival, I was talking about a book that I had written on Henry Clay and Daniel Webster and John Calhoun. And, and I would say to questions like this, that I have been to the 19th century, I've been to the past, and I return with good news and bad news. The good news is there was a time when our country was even more divided than it is today. The bad news is that it took a civil war to resolve those issues. And I can say something similar about the revolutionary period, which indeed did involve this civil war. Needless to say, not on the inter-American scale of the civil war of the 1860s, but it was a very divisive time. And, and during much of the 19th century, when people insulted one another in politics, it led to duels in which people died. So we're not to that stage. I have to say yet, and I'm not saying that we're going to get there, but I will say this, that if and when things do get worse to the point where some states talk about leaving the union. So if, for example, the Supreme Court upholds the Texas abortion law, and the national legislature is encouraged to pass a national anti-abortion law that is entirely plausible to me that states like California, the New York, might say, they might make the decision that southern states, 11 southern states made in the early 1860s, this national government no longer defends our interests. And then what will come of that? I don't know. And I don't know that this will happen, but I could, but if it comes to that, then I think I and other historians and people paying attention will be able to look back and see the precursors to this. And in this case, it might start in the 18, 1960s when the National Democratic Party embraces civil rights reform and basically gives permission to a lot of conservative Southerners who were legacy Democrats because of what happened in the 19th century to move to the party that was closer to their ideological affiliation. And so we have sorted out politically. And so as late as the 1980s, there were a sufficient number of conservative Democrats that Ronald Reagan could pass meaningful legislation on welfare reform, on immigration reform, on defense, on social security reform, and bipartisanship was possible. But we've reached a point where bipartisanship is essentially a dead letter. There's almost no incentive for any Republican member of Congress to support anything proposed by a Democratic president and vice versa. And I don't see any obvious way out. Now, it may be that a crisis comes along and people step back from the brink. 
They say, okay, we don't want to push it any farther than that. It's, it's another possibility is that some charismatically unifying figure comes along. So an American version of Nelson Mandela or something like this, who can really speak to people across both parties. Or maybe out of the blue, somehow this, their compromising spirit of Kentucky Henry Clay comes back and people will recognize that politics does not have to be a blood sport. Your opponent does not have to be your enemy. And you know, when it comes right down to it, we in America have a really good thing going. And so don't screw it up. And this, by the way, is something, this is the message that Benjamin Franklin gave to the British government in the 1760s and 1770s. He said, and he actually said this to Americans at the same time, but he said, you know, we've really got this good thing going. Now, don't be really stupid. You know, don't continue in this pig-headed direction you're going because you will alienate these people who are inclined to be big fans of the British Empire. But unfortunately, people, including people in power, sometimes do stupid things. And then it takes, unfortunately, I, I mean, I pray not, violence to deal with it. But I'd like to be more hopeful than I honestly am. So before we get to audience questions, which we absolutely want to do, do you think we're going to get another Henry Clay? Do you think we are on the road to a war like the type that Harlan saw? Well, I mean, I, listening to Professor Brand's talk, I, I have a little of the same perspective in that, uh, you know, I'm waiting for sort of reason to prevail in many ways. Uh, what I would add is that the parallels today with the uh, 1890s are, uh, the Supreme Court could well be uh, much more conservative in the country, and that could be a source of division, as you were suggesting on the abortion decision. Um, I, uh, I also think that, you know, uh, from the perspective of somebody who's worked in the media for 30 years, worked in mainstream journalism for 30 years, uh, the advent of the, of the internet as a politically organizing tool has pushed people to extremes in an, in an extreme situation. Uh, I also think that because of that, there's not recognition of bipartisanship or statesmanship or adherence to the law when we do recognize it. Now, one thing I would say, I'm guessing we have a large, largely liberal audience here. I can't predict. I don't know, know all the people who come out to the book, book festival. But, you know, I think that there was some degree of statesmanship that was shown in January when you had Donald Trump really pushing an idea that, that, that what amounted to a coup where he was saying that the vice president against all precedent, all reason, everything like that could somehow just on his own fiat throw out the election results. And um, instead of that happening, you had Mike Pence uh, facing a mob that wanted to kill him uh, say no, that he was not going to do that. You also had Bill Barr, much reviled by the left uh, as attorney general, say there was no evidence of, of fraud. Now, imagine if he had not done that and if the Justice Department had declared that there was fraud or declared the election to be uh, illegitimate or something like that, it would have plunged the nation into crisis. Ultimately, you expect that Congress uh, could be a backstop, but the House was willing to go along with Trump for anything. And Mitch McConnell of Kentucky stood up and said, no, this is a fair election. Biden's been elected. It wasn't even a, that close an election by historical standards. You know, we're standing by. So Pence, McConnell, and Barr all did things that were against their immediate political interest and caused them a lot of grief, but were done out of principle and out of, you know, an adherence to the American system. Where is the constituency to applaud that, though? Uh, among many other liberal people and liberal politicians in Washington who I talk to, they dismiss those acts as though, well, they did that, but think of all the other bad things they did. Or Mike Pence, you know, yeah, okay, well, you know, he didn't go along with Trump on the craziest thing Trump did, but he went along with Trump on everything else. And, you know, he also, by the way, uh, had an anti-gay agenda and is a hater, so we'll never be able to say a good word about him ever, ever, ever. You know, and the, Mitch McConnell is blocking a bill that's going to provide child care. And think of those children that are going to be without child care because of Mitch McConnell. It's tragedy. We'll never, ever say a good thing about Mitch McConnell. We can't, we can't function in that kind of a society. We just cannot. 
And there has to be a constituency for essentially people who honorably play by the rules and practice politics in a constructive way, uh, even if you strongly disagree with what they're doing or wish that some of those tactics they're using didn't exist. Um, and, and that's why I'm pessimistic. And I, I do blame the internet. I blame the decline of the mainstream media, the lack of a common language, a lack of a common set of facts. Uh, I, I think that has, has really plunged us into a dangerous position. Okay, so audience great. questions. We're gonna be coming around with a microphone. So if you could do that so yeah. we can hear you, that would be great. We certainly will. And uh, unfortunately, we only have time for a few, but I would like to, First of all, thank you guys. What an interesting conversation we're having so far. And, and remind the audience members that if you don't get a question up during this session, please visit our authors. That's what they're here for. They'd love to see you in person, but we'll take one or two. A week ago here in Lexington, Chuck Todd said that our political system would be better served by more than two parties. Uh, with the division in our society, could, could you foresee that? I mean, in 1860, Lincoln was elected with four uh, contestants for the presidency. Would that hold any possible, uh, if we move maybe to a more parliamentary system? If I can take that one on. Yeah, I think our country would be better served by more than two parties but I don't think there are going to be more than two parties until we change the fundamental structure of our government. Because unlike parliamentary systems that allow for proportional representation, nobody gets a seat in Congress unless that person wins 51% of the vote. And so everything, and that's true in the states as well. And so everything points in the direction of just two parties. Now, historically, the two parties have acted as vacuum cleaners that suck up ideas, popular notions from smaller parties. And that, that could happen today. It's not out of the question that we could have a, a buy or a trans party movement like the progressive movement of the early 20th century. It's not out of the question structurally, but for the reasons that Peter suggested, it'd be really hard to put together because most of those progressives from the early 20th century were on sort of the, the middle fringe, the inward fringe of their party. And those, and also it's really important to know that that was back in the days before primary elections. And primaries have the effect of pulling parties to the extremes. And so if we, if we could go back to the days when the politicos, the bosses, dominated the nominations, then we could have something like this. There are a bunch of problems relating to that, as you very know well, from looking at the late 19th century. But I don't think we're gonna get third parties. They just, the best we ever had, or at least the high tide of third parties, was the progressive party of Theodore Roosevelt in 1912, and that peaked and then went away. Now, many of those reform showed up on the democratic agenda in the 1930s, and that's sort of what happens. But yeah, it would be great if we could have three or four parties, but we're not gonna I, get them. I, I would say, I basically agree with you, but I, I would also note that compared to other times, just in our own lifetimes, um, you can see the fracture lines in the parties much more clearly now. I mean, the Trump, anti-Trump thing in the Republican party is a real division. And we saw the left, the progressive, centrist division in the Democratic Party playing out just in the last few weeks. So it's not entirely out of the question that the Joe Manchin wing could declare themselves to be whatever, conservative Democrats, Southern Democrats, something like, you know, there could be some way that within the party structure, they could start pulling, pulling apart, you know, in a way. Uh, but that's just a thought. That's a Actually, one more thing. On that subject, it seems to me that some of the most effective and interesting political decision-making occurs at the level of cities, many of which in this country operate on a nonpartisan basis. So if somehow you can get the parties out of the way, then ordinary people have a lot more common sense and a feeling of responsibility to the common good than their representatives in the formal parties often demonstrate. 
Great. We, we have time for one more question. And again, don't be dissuaded. Go and talk to these guys. Hang on. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the historian George Santayana uh, was famous for his dictum that those who do not learn from the past are doomed re to repeat it. And I always tell my students that he's not really saying that history is cyclical. He's saying, like you pointed out, you don't learn from your stupid mistakes, you'll make the same stupid mistakes again. But what it doesn't address is the prospect of making a brand new set of stupid mistakes that had never been anticipated for before. So how can history, how can a study of the past anticipate mistakes that have never been made before to avoid them, or can it? Well, a flippant answer is the one that Henry Kissinger gave when he said, we will not repeat the mistakes of the past. We will make our own mistakes. <laughs> and there's something to that. He was a historian as well as being a diplomat. What I would say is that don't look to history to predict the future. Although, we historians, we can't tell what's going to happen tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, we'll be right there to tell you why that was inevitable. <laughs> but I think one of the things that history can do is keep you from being surprised. So, I don't know who's going to win the election of 2024, the presidential election, but I will, I can imagine a scenario where Joe Biden wins, I can imagine a scenario where Donald Trump wins, and if there's somebody else, I could imagine that scenario. So history, if a close study of history, will give you an idea of the range of alternatives. It won't necessarily tell you which one it's gonna be, and that's because things that happen today are like things that happened in the past, but they're not exactly like things that happened in the past. And we never know until they play out whether the similarities or the differences are more important. But again, I would say if there's an abiding lesson of history is sort of modesty and humility. And so what good is history? Well, it does make us realize we're not the first generation to walk the face of the earth. And there were honest, sincere, intelligent people who lived before us. And they might have something to teach us. Not everything. They're not going to solve our problems for us. But they'll keep us from trying to use that old solution that failed 15 times in the past. So that's the best I got on that one. I like to say that history doesn't repeat itself. It rhymes. And um, it, it's getting at a lot of the same concepts that, you know, we've dealt with debates over immigration before. We've dealt with debates over nativism and pandemics and who is to blame for bringing in disease. Now, is it going to look the same as it looked in the 1790s? No, that was mosquitoes and yellow fever. But some of those similar concepts, the uh, potential to divide American citizens, those things come up again and again, and they can help us see you know, for example, if we know that there is going to be a natural disaster, we know that there are going to be people who suffer worse than others. And we can draw sort of the historical explanations for why that's the case. So I think those reoccurrent themes are really helpful to have an eye for the future. So I, I would only say that uh, it's great hearing both of you talk, and you are the historians on this panel. I am a journalist on this panel. I will say that I have been surprised by a lot of things that have happened politically the last few years, despite trying to keep a close eye on history. So uh, you never, you never know. I mean, we're constantly reinventing ourselves uh, every few years, and uh, you know, great hopes for the future, but uh, there certainly are some uh, potentially uh, troubling outcomes also out on the horizon too. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.